Hey, what is going on, everybody? And welcome to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for students looking to get ahead and learn more effectively, but a terrible resource for learning how to remove the tiny Chinese spy chips from your motherboards. I did just read about that. <laughs> I actually. did too, because um, uh, this is actually an embarrassing revelation about my life, but I have Reddit and Hacker News blocked on my phone until noon every day. So uh, in desperation while eating breakfast this morning, I went to Ars Technica, <laughs> which I should probably also block now that I'm talking about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're not supposed to like s- stop smoking and then say, oh, but I need something and then become an alcoholic. Like you're not supposed yeah, to just in desperation replace it I know. with something else. Well, okay. So I think the, the context this morning is I woke up... Um, Wow, this is going to make me sound like a horrible productivity guru, but I stayed up late last night trying to beat Celeste B-Sides. Terrible productivity guru. <laughs> you did this to me. This is your fault. You made me start playing the Celeste it's B-Sides. Game. And I was going to go to bed at a normal time, but then I was like, all right, this B-Side has to be done. Like, I have to be close to the end. And then, of you, course, I get stuck in rooms that. that take me like 20 minutes each to beat, and you I'm not even close. That. I've put like 37 hours into that game, and it's a relatively short, yeah. like, you know, content-wise. So I got up, and I slept in extra because I value my sleep. And I I no longer do the dog-headed thing I used to do when I was younger, where I, if I go, to, if I went to bed late, I would still get up at the same time. I now respect my sleep needs, so I sleep the amount of hours I need. I got up, I made breakfast for Anna and me. And then, like, she had me read some fiction she was writing. I got done. And I wasn't done eating. So I'm like, all right, I want to read something. And I went to Ars Technica. And he, and then he said, Anywho. all right, allow me to have a moment with just my thoughts to fully intake and appreciate this food okay. and this moment. Maybe that's what I should have done. But you know what? You read about that story, too. Yeah, so. later on. Anyway, yeah, apparently there's some story out about um, motherboards like, uh, that were sold to Amazon and Apple having like these spy chips embedded, like sandwiched between the yeah, fiberglass and, and, and the motherboard. And there were some in like government stuff or Dude, something. Dude, I'm scared. It's, like, I, it's like real spooked. If it's, if it's sandwiched between the fiberglass of the, of the motherboard, like how how do you know uh, any device is safe? I just assume I mean, they're all well, in the In the internet age, nothing is safe. That's true. Everything is so beyond like our ability to verify and check and our understanding. I'm not going to build my own of... computer from my own whatever I would build that out of just to make sure nothing's in it. You know, will, I'd have to you, start every, all the software and hardware myself. I, if you I build can't. it yourself, I believe it's called a tuckuter. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> well, those work really well. Yeah, but like There's, there's nothing well. you can do. There are too many layers of trust, and you're going to be betrayed on several of them mm-hmm. at any given moment. Yeah, basically it's like a process of constant imperfect mitigation. Yeah. I can't do anything about the tiny spy chips that may or may not be in my motherboard, but I can at least make sure my passwords are changed and my two-factor authentication is on. Yeah. Uh, And while I'm thinking about it, if you haven't listened to it, dear listener, go listen to our episode about internet security because I think everyone should listen to that episode. It's a bunch of stuff people don't want to think about, but... Until it's too late. Yeah, exactly. Until it's too late. It's like your health. You don't want to think about like having a heart attack until you have one. So why not just do things that make you not have one in the first place? Oh, and you know what? I was annoyed at how expensive my health insurance is here, but I just hit my out-of-pocket maximum for the year due to the finger surgery. So now I'm like, wait, hey, all the follow-up stuff's free. Yeah. I mean, it would have been nice if like- It actually feels good. The government paid for that. Overall, I've saved a bunch of money. Oh, well, yeah, obviously. But within (laughs) within this absurd system that I must deal with, my insurance has now paid for itself this year. Yeah. And now it's feels good. Just take care of things. I was you. annoyed all year. Then at the very end, that's how it happens. Yeah, I mean that's kind of how I view insurance. I don't worry about it. Like, I mean, it's it sucks to have to pay however much I have to pay every month. Oh yeah, well it's just like it's, it's like the effort happens. to be secure on the internet. You yeah. know, you're like, I don't care. This is a dumb waste of my time. Why am I even doing this? Mm-hmm. Suddenly, it's worth it. Plus, I'm very aware of the fact that as much as I try to be careful, I do things that are dangerous. Yeah, you do. So like, I would like to have that safety net there. So, yeah. yeah. In fact, um, so Colorado and specifically the Denver area just got two brand new Ninja Warrior training gyms. And I went to one yesterday and had a, an awesome training session. And some of the coaches who work there are actual like competitors on the show. I thought you were going to say actual ninjas. There, that act- was gonna there be are cool. actual ninjas. Whoa. Except for those of them, you never see them. 
<laughs> they just sort of whisper tips like from the rafters, I think. I'm not sure where the yeah. voices are coming from. They're also good at throwing their voices. But yeah, there was a guy, I think is, uh, oh, what is his name? Now I can't remember his name, which makes me feel dumb. Uh, but he has competed in every single season, huh. which I think is like 11 seasons so far. Or maybe it's only seven. But it's a lot. I didn't even know that was a currently running show. Yeah. Um, they are gearing up for next season next hmm. year. And I think auditions or at least like video submissions are going to happen in, I, th- so I think someone was telling me like February or March. So That's cool. if I want to compete next year, I have like from now to then to really focus on my weak points. And maybe we should do an entire episode on this. I want to do a video series. I just don't know how I'm going to structure that. How to prepare for Ninja Warrior. Well, I want to do, I kind of want to do like almost like, like vlog style, like yeah, vlog road style to would Ninja make Warrior. Sense. I want to break down the entire, like, like I want to do like a rapid skill learning challenge. Like, all right, how do I break this down into components? How do I identify my weak points? Now, how do I develop progressions in a training regimen? Maybe I should go find an expert, things like that. I would love to do that. I just need to figure out how to create that content because I'm not, I've never done like vlog style stuff before. I've never like filmed the majority of what I do outside of my home. Yeah. I don't know. So it'd, it'd be, be cool different. to go over like skill building, stuff like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, and this episode is about a skill building thing. That's it's true. just not a, not a longer running thing, but we could get more specific. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, we'll put a pin in the Ninja Warrior stuff for now, but expect more on it because I do fully intend to compete on the show. And, oh, I almost forgot to say this. Sunday, I suppose uh, people are going to listen to this the day after it happened, but mm-hmm. this coming Sunday as we record this, I have my first ninja competition at the gym. Oh, nice. So not on the show, but it will. it's, it's against Koga. I consider, yes, it is against Koga, and hopefully his wheezing doesn't use self-destruct on me because i'm using low hp pokemon <sighs> why do you send me on these tangents <laughs> that's what i do all it takes is like three words it really does and then anna is going to make fun of me while she's editing it i'm gonna make you look like a rambler she makes fun of me so much because i'll say something like this will only take a second and then it's 10 minutes anyway first ninja competition i consider it to be a benchmark so i've gone and done a little bit of training there but i want to go see how I do on something that's an actual competition against other people. Yeah. And then that will allow me to sort of benchmark where I currently am and figure out what the gap between that and what I feel a successful preparation would be for at least completing the qualifying stages. I don't, I don't harbor any hopes of actually winning because almost nobody does. And also because grip strength takes years to build. You just want but to clear the barrier. I of want entry, to clear basically. the first stage. Yeah. If I can do that, well, then I'll probably get hungrier and want to do more. But I will also be happy, and I will consider that my would first be cool. goal to have been met. Anyway, so today we are going to talk about something that maybe isn't like right in the wheelhouse of this podcast, but this podcast has morphed into us just talking about cool things. Anyway, I think it had to morph into to more open yeah. like subjects anyway, because how many episodes can we do on how to focus? Eventually, the answer is, well, we told you, uh, try doing it. Oh, I could do like we can't just say the same things over and over for 200 and what episode is this? A lot. 232. Yeah, we're going to have to mix it up eventually. Oh, I could do infinite episodes on focus on my YouTube channel. If I wanted to just pander. Yeah, but these are these are like an hour views. worth of stuff. That's true. Where we basically like we hash out almost the whole of a topic when we when we get to it. It's not yeah. like we can just say here are eight tips and then say one sentence for each and then it's like a ten minute podcast. The format. Yeah. This format demands blood. Well, one of my very good friends just wrote a book called Hyperfocus. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. I do want to read it and then I feel like it's, it's probably no, well, worthy like, of discussion. I like doing focus topics. <laughs> I'm just saying we can't do like 30 in a row it's true, yeah. on the podcast because you'd, you'd, you'd have to say the same things yeah. in all 30 episodes. So today what we're going to talk about is how to get good at photography. <clears throat> uh, and I think the catalyst for this episode was an email that we got from Andre, I believe, uh, asking you a bunch of questions actually about your photography practice. Yeah, because somebody asked. I wasn't just like, I want to yes. really talk about me. Yeah, let's talk about my Let's favorite hobby. That. Let's just use that. Use the platform for uh, 
just I want to riff on. No, stuff. it was actually it was actually really helpful to get an email yeah. with uh, all the questions laid out like that too, mm-hmm. because that more or less is is like going to be the focus of the episode. It's like a full episode's worth of questions. Yeah, it's right there. It's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Um, so if people don't know, you have been doing a one photo per day challenge on your Instagram. For, I have indeed. What is it? 171 days. 177, so I think. Now. Oh, okay. Nice. And by the time this comes out, it will be a little higher. Nice. And if people want to follow you and see those photos and decide whether or not you are qualified to talk about all these tips we're going to talk about here or not, where should they go? Uh, that would be Yo Bartholomew on Instagram. Like Bartholomew, but with an M because I'm Martin. I, I don't know. We Bartholomew is long for... I came up with that. Martin is... What is it? Oh, yeah. What did you say it was? Martin isn't short for Bartholomew, but Bartholomew is long for Martin. That's what it is. You know, like if I wanted to be some like uh, kingly, timely person where like, uh, Brother Bartholomew, fetch That's us the, something. Like it sounds real good. Yeah, it does sound good. That's all. So it's Yo Bartholomew. And uh, I'm not a master of stuff, but you know, I've been doing enough stuff that I should clearly have some experience here. You know that Netflix series, Master of None? That like Aziz, yes. Sorry, made. Yeah. I haven't seen it, but every time I see it, like the little tile on Netflix, I'm like, that's kind of a distillation of my life. I feel, yeah, because I just, I haven't seen. And the I don't show. know if you feel the same way that I do about your own life, but I feel like I just do a lot of things, and I enjoy the process of getting relatively good at it, and then I inevitably move to something else. Well, I think like, that's I'm a not, good way to live, and people don't it's true. don't want to like. Uh, Mastery is all great and everything, but very few of us are going to be the best in the world at something. Yeah. And if you if the point that you're looking for is joy, then being mildly good at tons of things one after the other it can be a very fulfilling way to live. We just don't yeah. give it any credit. That's true. I keep seeing this Jordan Peterson video floating in my YouTube recommendations, even though I never watch Jordan Peterson videos. But the title is like, do you want to have a happy life or do you want to be exceptionally good at one thing? With the implication being it's... A binary choice. If you want to be exceptionally good at one thing, you need to sacrifice everything else. Yeah, you need to be so disciplined that you never stop. I I think that that is true to a large degree. Um, And I think I've just kind of come to terms with the fact that I don't want to be known as the best in the world at one thing. I would much rather have a balanced life where I have time with friends and I do a lot of fun things and I do achieve a lot of cool goals, but Maybe I never climb a V15 boulder, or maybe I never become the best guitarist in the world, but maybe I do release an album and maybe I do climb a V10 someday. Yeah. Like I'd be happier having done both of those things. Yeah. And if you focus too much on one thing, like this is good if it's what you want or you're really obsessive about the one thing, but it could also kind of take over who you are. You could become a symbol of yeah. that thing and then like if i'm if i'm now the greatest violinist suddenly maybe people are only going to know me for that and nobody's ever going to say hey martin what's uh what's your favorite switch game they're never going to consider that because i'm now such an expert in one thing that that's the only thing i they think i'm qualified to speak on yeah and that would potentially be lonely if you wanted to talk about switch games that's true which i, I there are so many good do. ones yeah <laughs> i just got towerfall on the switch what a good game so uh, let's just go through the questions in this email. You've been doing photography for quite a while. And um, as we go through these questions, if I come up with other questions, I'll just add them in. Yeah. If I feel like another question could add some crucial detail. But before we go into these questions, I want to know, like, what's your take on, on why we even do an episode like this? Like, why does the average person even care about getting good at photography? Well, um, so for photography specifically, I think that it has some benefits. Uh, Largely, I find it to be very meditative. But in general, this is a really good episode example for, I think, any skill. The the way I've gone about it, the projects I've taken on to continue it, and the kind of thought behind why I'm enjoying it, you know, the like the fact that I even think it's meditative and I think that's what I like about it, I'm putting an extra layer on it. And if anybody applies that to their own skills or things they're thinking about doing mm-hmm. and they kind of kind of take off the top, the top meta layer of this episode, they should be able to apply it to other things yeah. and be like, wait, I actually like this also because it's kind of meditative or for the opposite reason, because you accelerate really fast and you want to constantly be moving. Yeah. And... Um, 
that basically the the care and the persistence with which I've been pursuing this, I think, should be something that would work for most skills. So this is something that sort of like builds the meta skill. Essentially, yeah, yeah, and I learning. think it would be if we come up with it, it'd be cool. I think to talk about other skills too, just because this is a pretty common one. I think people are interested in. Yeah, plenty of people want to do photography, but also just in general. It's good to see people try new things. I'm not an expert at this. I am probably a better programmer and a language learner, but I did something completely new starting like three years ago, and this is what it's like to do something completely out of your wheelhouse. Yeah, and I feel like you've you've taken at least a few pictures that like if I saw that in a gallery, I would think a pro photographer took them. So yeah, I've got a, hand, I got a handful that I really like. A little bit. Um, as, and I suppose, like, to add to what you said in terms of benefits, what I was thinking going into an episode like this is everyone has these days a pretty decent point and shoot camera in their pocket That's because true. everyone's got a phone. And maybe not for everyone, but for a lot of people, there are always just situations you find yourself in where you're going to take photos. And if you can learn just a few little things to tweak the way you take photos, yours are going to be twice as good as a normal person's photo. Maybe not pro, but a few things can elevate normal, unflattering or uninspiring photos on your Facebook profile or your Instagram profile or a headshot for your LinkedIn or stuff you're selling on Craigslist to look a lot better and get yeah. you better results. I think that uh, the way you communicate both in a verbal and written fashion, but also in the visual medium or you know the visual medium can get you far if you can do it just a little bit better than everyone else which is why we have like a president who was a tv personality and why we had ronald reagan who was a tv personality you know a lot of times people are like well these people aren't qualified to do this or they're less qualified than someone else and i'm like well they know how to use our visual mediums and our mass communication tools it's like personal better. branding can overcome a lot of exactly yeah like any lack of anything else because I mean, that's the front layer, and that's what people yeah. become attached to. Most people don't look deeper into something than the personal brand, so you need the yes. personal brand to be a good impression. Yeah. So for me, I'm not an artistic photographer like you are, but I see photography as a tool that if I can get a little bit better at it, I can use that to improve my personal brand and use it as a, as a way to unlock doors. It's like a competitive advantage. And I think that... To elevate your game from where you are, if you're a totally average photographer, to like a significant degree, could take you like an afternoon of practice. Just knowing a few different tips. Like, you know, rule of thirds, composition, lighting, a few things. Yeah. Um, you know, varying up your angle, like your height angle, things like that. So that's why I think this is interesting for, for the average lay person. Uh, so let's go into the first question that Andre sent you, which is why do you enjoy photography as a hobby? And I think you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but maybe there's a bit more to it. Uh, yeah, so it's a meditative hobby, like I was saying, uh, sometimes too meditative. But like um, when I'm taking photos, I kind of have no idea what time it is. I have no idea how long anything is taking. I might spend an hour taking one or two photos because wow. I'm looking so specifically at everything around me, trying to figure out what I want to photograph and, and looking at different angles and seeing how the light might affect something or how it might affect something later, mm -hmm. given where the shadow is going to be at a given time. It's a very present-minded thing. I can't be thinking about something else and taking photos well at the same time. So I really like that aspect. Another aspect is that it's not a computer-based skill. Yeah. I don't. And you said that many times. Uh, I I love having a skill that's not on a computer. I get that there is a screen on the camera, but for the most part, it's not screen based. Yeah. I'm taking photos of real things. I wouldn't even count that because it's that like screen it's like is technically a there's a screen of but, a viewfinder. Yeah. That's like not the same, the same, uh, yeah. the same intent. No, it's like I want to be present minded. I want to be in the real world, and I want to yeah. be off of my computer and off of my phone as much as possible. And for that reason, I don't really edit my photos. I just pull them into Lightroom, and then that's it. So I don't want to learn yeah. how to edit them. I could, but I don't want to because then it would become a computer skill. Yeah. 
and I would once again be doing everything on my laptop. Well, I think it speaks to the amount of skill you can build outside of editing because your photos often, I mean, they look better than anything I've taken for sure. But in terms of like the vibrancy of colors, uh, often your photos look better than mine. And I edit pretty much every photo I take. Anything you see on my Instagram has probably been ran through Snapseed or, or Lightroom if I'm feeling really fancy. And you just don't do that. No. At all. Like you literally nope. just bring it in. I would probably it, be too perfectionist about it as well. Yeah. So I know that I would like spend years on every photo. And now that I've posted 188, different from the daily thing because the first day I posted 12. And I would not want to edit 188 photos. It would yeah. absolutely be unsustainable for me. I would, I would hate it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's actually a good lesson in, in that um, there's this saying that's very prevalent in photography, more often in music recording and um, making movies, where people will often say, oh, we can fix that in post. And you can to a degree, but there's no substitute for getting it right at the source. So if it's an audio recording, like we want to make sure these mics are picking up our voices at a good level of gain so we don't have peaking that we have to try to cut out later, or we don't have it so low that we have to artificially boost it and then it sounds bad. And I think a lot of times people will rush through one step of a process because they feel like a later step of the process can be used to fix it. And at that point, you're just building a house of cards. Yeah. And you can't like, you can definitely take a photo where there's nothing you do in post is going to make yeah. it better. You have to have some degree of like envisioning the right thing. And and that's mm -hmm. actually another part of why I like photography. I've never built any sort of skill for illustration or visual art for the most part, other than occasional pixel art, because that's very that's like, it's very like mathematical. mathematical so yeah. it's easy for me to judge how I want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but photography as an art form, if you choose to use it that way, is very much about the mental processes first more, because like it's about you got to come up with what, what do I want to express with this? What am I trying to share? How am I going to share it? What angle? How do I do all this stuff? It's all the planning. And then you need the basic level of camera understanding and skills to use that. Yeah. But like if I were to do another thing, like if I was an illustrator, that last step would take so long after, after so much work. Like I couldn't post daily yep. if I was doing illustrations with the degree of completed work that I'm doing on a camera. But that's because mm -hmm. this work is almost entirely the mental part. Yeah. Once you've built the basic skills. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to do it a lot. And I like that. Yeah. Ooh, one comment I want to make there, and I don't think this has to do with much with photography, but I've heard people get frustrated that like their medium doesn't allow them to post as often as they would like. And they feel like, and I think we may have actually referenced this on the social media episode, because they are, say, an illustrator, they can't grow their following quite as quickly because they can't post every day. And it's like, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's quality over quantity. And the medium you chose simply takes more time to create something that, from an outward-facing perspective, is high quality. So you just have to live with that. Yeah. You know, maybe photography allows you to be quicker, but an illustrator doesn't want to be well, a photographer. Well, it's, it's like... So. I like they're not competing. Illustrators yeah. aren't competing with photographers because it's mm -hmm. just that you know the medium's way different. You wouldn't be like, how come this this band has way more followers than me? They put out one album this year. Yeah. I have thirty photos. That's more than they have songs. It's yep. just not. It can't be the same. And I think there's always grass is greener syndrome. Like I'm sure you've had a day where it's like super gray and overcast, and you were just like, I wish I could just oh, draw you know something what? amazing. Yeah. Honestly, that's that's one of the things that doesn't get looked at because everybody everybody like. Not everybody. Pe a lot of people are like, yeah, well, camera's easy. You just click the button. And one, that's clearly not true. You need a basic level yeah. of skill and understanding of how cameras work and lighting and everything like that. But two, yes, but anything I want to express artistically has to be made real. Yeah. I can't say I really want to make something that's like a squid with bat wings. Then I'm going to have to find a squid and glue bat wings to it or like build then it out of clay. At that point. If I build it out of clay, I had to master another art form to do it. <laughs> yep. Like I can't just throw imagination into it. If the lighting is bad that day, if that flower's in the wrong stage of growth and I wish it was a little further along, there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, illustrations like pure imagination and skill. 
And photography is imagination, but you also need to have the world cooperate with your imagination. Yeah. So there and, is a limitation and that's, baked in. I kind of like it though. It's like yeah. it's like uh, scavenger hunting. Almost. Yeah, it's true. It's like I'm going out to see what I can appreciate about like what if there's what if there's a cool bug out today. I'm mm-hmm. gonna look as hard as I can. And I think the the time that struck me most in this regard is when we were all in Moab in Utah, at that amazing national park with all these crazy rock structures, and you were like, "This is so cool," but it is the middle of the day. And there's no cloud cover. So any photo I take is going to be like kind of flat because the light is just so yeah. from above. It's, you know, not sunset or sunrise. So nothing really looks dynamic or cool. Yeah. And I posted some just, just because, but like, I don't consider them nearly my best photos because mm-hmm. there wasn't anything I could do about it. It was so bright and hot. Yeah. That's you would have had to get up at 4 a.m. We would have had to drive out there, find like a spot and then wait for sunrise to get something a little bit more elevated in quality. Yeah. And, you know, an illustrator can wake up and just work at their own base. So there's always pros and cons to every single discipline. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I think this is going to be the, the biggest question. How does one get started with photography? Uh-oh. Okay. So, one, it's a good thing you pointed out. Everybody's got their phones already. So mm-hmm. we've already And I think that's how you start as a YouTuber, to start. too. Oh, yeah, that would make sense. Yep. That would make perfect sense. Just as a little so, aside. Basically, you're just going to have to make a point to go like for a walk somewhere around something that interests you and try to take photos intentionally, Mm -hmm. not just snapshots. I consider snapshots completely different. I have a different folder on my computer for when I'm like, oh, that's a cool thing. That's just I wanted to have the memory. That's not like a photo to me. Okay. It's a snapshot. What's the difference? Well, I don't think other people use this way. But to me, a photo is when I artistically tried to do something with it. If, If I see a cool bug and it's like on the sidewalk and I just quickly snap it because I want to like send it to somebody and be like, look at this, it's ridiculous. I don't consider it a photo unless I really tried to like position it and make it look cool, something that I would want printed and put on a wall. So it's like the difference between this is a bug and this is a beautiful photo. It's like, yeah, it's like it's the intention behind it. Did I try? Yeah. Basically, it doesn't have to be good, but did I try to make it something? Mm -hmm. And um, so you're just going to have to go out and try stuff and really think what would I, what would make me like this photo? Is it uh, the positioning, the lighting? Is this topic interesting to me? Should I be closer or farther? And so that's, that's the basics. But when I tested this out, it was back in 2015. So I borrowed my uh, now fiance's point and shoot camera and everybody can just do this with their phones also. I think the point and but, shoot camera was worse than most people's phones. Yeah, yeah it was pr- it was not good. I don't know <laughs> I don't know the state of anything else at that time, but I kind of just wanted to have the feel of a camera and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I borrowed that and I started in August and I sort of just started taking pictures. I went on long lunch walks every day at work just down this trail and I looked for stuff to take photos of. Yeah. And the thing that made me realize I like macro actually was there was this little ladybug that was like missing a wing, but was eating something that appeared to have been fighting it earlier. Oh, and I was so like, one. but I couldn't get close enough because yeah. uh, cameras have a minimum uh, focal distance yeah. where you can't focus if you're too close to something without like a special macro lens. Right. And I just couldn't get it. And I was like, but I re- this is a really interesting moment. I want to capture it, but I can't capture it. And that mm-hmm. kind of annoyed me. And that's what led me down this way. But so two weeks after that, I'd been taking photos for two weeks. They're almost universally garbage. They're all terrible, but I liked them. Yeah. I was doing something that was, it was fun to go out and take the photos. Um, two weeks later, I, uh, I bought my own camera. I bought my current camera, but I had already, I had also signed up for a bunch of photography classes mm-hmm. at my, uh, the local botanic gardens. Yeah. And the one up in our college town. Yeah. Yeah. The one in the Ryman gardens. So I had signed up for a bunch of those classes so that I could learn how to do it. I had no expectation that I was just going to magically figure it out. And I bought the, bought that camera and it was, uh, it's a Sony alpha a 6,000 mirrorless camera. It's like to get it with its default lens is like $550. Okay. But I was pretty committed at this point and it only took me two weeks to get to that point because well, I uh, I had bad nerve damage, so I couldn't That's do right, any yeah. of my other hobbies: instruments, video games, books. For the most part, cooking like all my hobbies were dead to me. Yeah, I couldn't do them physically, so I I wanted something else, and cameras turned out to be something I could still do. Because you don't have to really 
manipulate it too much. It's just yeah. kind of And I got the mirrorless because it's light. So yeah. it was easy for me to carry it for a long time. So I have my new camera. I'm taking classes. It took me another month of taking photos before I even got to a photo that I liked. And that's the very first photo that's on my Instagram account. Okay. Um, it's just got some... So that little... one's older then? Yeah. The first, um, little, the first day I had the Instagram account, I posted 12 to have a f- filled out profile. And it was kind of here are all the photos I care about so far gotcha. that I've taken. So that very first one's like taken three years earlier than I posted it. Mm. But it took me the first two weeks, then I bought a camera, then another month of taking photos that were just not good. And then I took one that I liked and I was like, yeah. well, that's cool. I actually like that one. And it's just taken so much time. And I don't think there's really other any other way to start it than to just go out and do it a lot to figure out what you like because uh, let me see I've got the numbers here somewhere so today it'll be higher by the time this goes out but today I have 188 photos on 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 my Instagram Instagram. account okay but I've taken over 2800 probably closer to 3000 now because I've taken a lot in the last week so Um, you have more than a 10 to 1 throwaway ratio yes and these are the ones that I'm just posting on my Instagram account But there is another layer past that that are ones that I thought were good enough to keep in Lightroom. Mm -hmm. So there's like like 3,000 photos here. Then I layer it out. And then I say, these are cool. I like them. But these ones are worth sharing. I cut it out again. And if I at any point start to sell photo prints, I'm going to cut another layer off the top and say, these were worth sharing. But they're not good enough to sell as a print anywhere. Yeah. So like you have to do it a lot. You, you will have so many throwaway things. And that would feel, and actually this is important because it would feel harder for me to start another medium yeah. and fail 3,000 times. That's you, true. You know that quickly? It's Though I think with, um, again, to like hammer home the point that mediums have their differences, I would say taking a thousand photos is probably akin to doing 50 drawings yeah possibly yeah like, you don't like, need like to the time wise and, and the investment mm-hmm. but it means that i have to feel the sting of that wasn't good enough yeah in rapid succession yeah just over and over and over and over and over but that's that's how i started it the the classes i took at the botanic garden were actually really helpful just some beginner classes This week's episode of our show is brought to you as our many episodes by our good friends over at Brilliant. Brilliant is an enrichment tool for learning math, science, and computer science incredibly effectively. And the way that they do this is they create courses that are based entirely around very active learning. Once you go into one of their courses, you're going to be immediately thrown into challenging problems that basically force you to dig down and really start trying to solve things on your own, which is a big contrast to how most lecture style classes in college and high school operate, where you come in, you have to sit in a chair, you have to introduce yourself and tell everyone what your favorite breed of dog is. And then of course, there's probably, you know, a week's worth of just passive lecture style material being thrown at you before you get to actually start doing something. Brilliant doesn't work like that. When you go into a course, you're immediately solving problems. And if you get stuck, they do have an amazingly detailed wiki that allows you to dig in and start learning the concepts more in depth so you can come back and actually get those answers correctly filled in. So while you're learning all of these subjects, whatever you know you decide to start learning, you're also becoming a universally better problem solver because you're applying yourself and you're challenging yourself to stretch your capabilities, which is going to apply to everything you do in your future endeavors. Now they have a ton of courses in their library. They have math courses like calculus and math for quantitative finance. They have probability courses, uh, science courses like gravitational physics and computer courses like computer science algorithms and machine learning. Though the course that I wanted to highlight this week is their astronomy course because that is an application of optic technology that we didn't really discuss in this episode since we're talking about taking pictures of bugs and such. but it is the exact same technology that allows us to look at the stars and learn about how our universe works. And if you would like to learn more in depth how our universe works, then that is a course you're definitely going to want to sink your teeth into. So if you want to start learning for free today, you can go over to brilliant.org slash college info geek. And if you are one of the first 83 people to go to that link and sign up, you're also going to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. Once again, brilliant.org 
dot org slash college info geek and once again i want to give a big thanks to the team over at brilliant for being a huge supporter of college info geek in general and sponsoring this episode let's get back into it how do you feel about your old work which old work so uh, how, how let me old? give this question some con some context i know people who the moment they make something they never want to look at it again. They're like, all right, I'm past that. I kind of hate it. I'm moving to the next thing. I'm different. When I make something, I tend to really like it and be proud of it. And then even as I get better and better, I look back on stuff that I made. And even if I can see the rough edges, I'm still very proud of it and like it. And like, I will listen to music I've made like a year ago and still like it. Even though I can hear the mistakes, I'm just like, I still enjoy it. So like, what side do you kind of fall on in that question? I still enjoy them enough, but I'm, if I were to list out the photos that I'm like excited about, like I had to, I had to do, suddenly I get my own gallery. I get to pick some photos to put on a wall. I'd probably pick like six out of the 188. Really? <laughs> like I'm really only excited and consistently proud about a few and mm -hmm. Right now, I'm more excited about the very recent ones because I've been challenging myself. Yeah, you've been doing to some take different different stuff. Uh, subjects because mm -hmm. it's it's going to get colder. So uh, taking constant flowers and insects is not going to be an option. That's true. Which is once again one of the limitations. I have to work seasonally. Mm -hmm. I have to find new subjects now. But like, it's not like I hate my old work, but I'm not gonna like try to show it to anyone or really care about it that much other than the very few like the ant on the flower that like i'm particularly pleased so with. some so some like sometimes your work hits a certain level where you're like that's really good and i'm always gonna like that yeah i can i think i'm yeah i think i'm like i'm not gonna like delete that. it all i don't yeah. hate it but i it's just it's not gonna resonate with me for long most of the time that makes sense it's more about the experience of going out and challenging myself yeah. rather than the photos for the most part i think that's kind of how i am like i look back on my youtube channel and uh, you know i'm proud of most of it but there's definitely a few videos like the flashcard video and the hydration video those are the two that kind of stick in my head and the sherlock holmes video i think those are the three where i'm like i'm most proud of those because I just took some element of it so far beyond yeah. what I normally do. And I don't know, like, I think I'll always be proud of those. But yeah, I think the rest of them, like, oh, I, I like them, but I'm not excited about all of them all yeah. the time. Yeah. And moving on to the next stuff. All right, so basically you just get started and you go out with an intention to make something artistic. Yeah, and I, I think the intention is the, the main thing because we've all taken photos with our cameras, mm. but have you tried to take a photo where you would like use that as a wallpaper or you would yeah. print that out and put it, or you're like, look what I did there. Look at what the light's doing to that. That's, that's a really weird thing I took a photo of. I'm interested in that mm -hmm. rather than just click it as fast as you can. Yeah. Uh, all right, so the next question, should one have an expensive transformer-like camera with a lens that can see through your soul? Yes, clearly, <laughs> that's because that's a cool feature. Or is a smartphone camera just fine? See, I guess, I think we kind of already nailed that one because we said smart, start with your smartphone. Yeah, you, you, can, you can take whatever, you can take a good photo yeah. in a camera it won't be as good as if you had taken it in a in a full thing because there are physic there are like physics limitations to right. how cameras work the mirrorless is a like a big technology shift to make it smaller yeah and we can't get it into cameras with the quite as many things you can do yet but or in phones but like you can take a good photo with your phone mm -hmm. and uh if you look at most of what i've taken in recent most of what i've taken this year is from a particularly expensive like $1,100 lens, but yeah. I had taken photos for two and a half years straight and still loved it. Mm -hmm. And I rented that lens first from, I think, borrowlenses.com maybe. Yeah. But like you don't need the expensive stuff. And I waited a long time before I got expensive stuff. Yeah. It would have been really dumb of me to just drop down like $1,100 on a lens and be like, well, this hobby's kind of lame actually. Mm -hmm. That'd be a terrible idea. Don't get something expensive until you've proven it to yourself. And I think that is that is um, useful advice for any hobby. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can overinvest in like anything. You have. 
my first pair of figure skates were $100. They were like the lowest tier ones you could buy. And I used those and I did learn to skate and I took coaching and I learned waltz jumps and all kinds of stuff on them until finally my coach was like, all right, you've graduated from these. Now it's time for you to buy the $900 skates. And I was like, all right. you know. And now I totally understand why they're worth that much money. Yeah. But when I was a beginner, I did not need those. And I could have gotten bored and quit that sport. So I'm well, glad that I waited. Not, not even just that. If you spend, so if I went out and I dropped, like I spent the $500 after I'd convinced myself I had the money to get that at the time. But if mm. I went and dropped $2,000 to get into a new hobby, not only am I at risk of wasting all that money if I get bored, but now every time I go out to do that hobby, I've got kind of this subconscious expectation on myself. Like, don't you waste that 2000 You Ooh, better true. you better love this and you better go take some good stuff. And every day I'm like, well, this isn't that fun. There's going to be that voice is like, well, it better be fun because you just dropped all yeah. your money on it. So now you've got all this pressure that you don't have the freedom to say, actually, I don't like this. And you know what else? And you need that. I think if you immediately buy the best tools, you are not going to know how to use them properly because you didn't come up with a more limiting, cheaper tool and you didn't get intimately familiar with your limitations and then graduate to a tool. You don't like, even oh, know why it's good. That. You don't even, yeah, exactly. You don't know why it's good. You're just like, well, I guess I'll just, you know, use it. Also, your but photos like, will be bad. Yeah. So if you come up using a crappy camera and you're like, oh, the minimum focal distance on this is terrible. I can't get a good macro. Now you get a macro lens. Now you know what it can do. Now you know where you can push yourself because before the tool was the limitation. Yeah. You know, if you immediately buy uh, expensive gear, well then you're the limitation, but you might not know where to go. And I don't think that this is like a hard and fast thing. Like you could easily buy an expensive thing and then learn, but I think it's totally fine to start on cheaper gear because it's going to teach you what that better gear will do. You're going to appreciate it more and you're also going yeah. to know like where I can apply it. Yeah, you're going to care a lot more and you're going to do a lot better with it because otherwise you, you're going to have all that expectation. You're going to be frustrated when your output still sucks because mm -hmm. you're not good at it yet. If you've got like a million dollars in the bank, go ahead and drop whatever you want on any new hobby because it doesn't matter to you. But I think for yeah. most people, you, you don't want to take that risk up front. And there's an appreciation too. And I cannot tell just, you, after playing my $300 guitar for a year or two years mm -hmm. and then buying my $3,000 guitar... Just like the first time I played it in the store and heard the difference in sound, being intimately familiar with the sound of a cheap guitar, it was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing hearing my hands play something that sounded that good. So now it's worth the money even more. It's so worth it. And I, I regret nothing buying that guitar. I could have bought a used car for that, but like having put in the hours and proven to myself that that's what I want to do and then investing the money in something that was truly worth it, there's no regret. Like, yeah. I love it. Even though I actually play the old one more. Hmm. And the reason, I think a lot of people uh, who get into music will eventually learn this. Maybe not for pianists because that you probably buy one piano and you have it out I'm not going to have two pianos. That's true. But for a guitarist, if you own a very nice guitar, you keep it in the case because you need a humidifier, especially if you live in Colorado. Oh yeah. You don't want that wood warping. You don't want the fret bars coming uh, away from the neck, things like that. So, uh, you know, any musician will tell you, you will play most often the one that is most accessible. My cheap guitar sits out on a stand in the living room all the time because I don't care about humidifying that one quite as much. In the winter, maybe I will, but during the summers I'm like, it's $300 guitar. I want it out all the time. So I play that thing all the time. That's fair. But then sometimes I'm like, all right, this isn't a, I'm just going to sit down and play for five minutes because I'm bored and then end up playing for an hour moment. This is a, I want to hook up my amp and my looper pedal and like deliberately play. I'm getting out the good one. And every time I do that, it's like special occasion. And I feel like I can record on that new guitar and like make things that sound good. Yeah. So that's awesome. I want to modify uh, Andre's question here because he, he asked the simple binary question, should you go out and buy expensive gear or start with a smartphone? We know, okay. start with what you have. But why upgrade from a technical standpoint and maybe where would you make upgrades first? So the first thing, I guess why upgrade is cameras have physics involved. 
um, for a long time, DSLRs, like there's a mirror in there and I don't know exactly how all the inside works. You, you could Google a diagram or something. But the way that the light comes in through the lens, there's a thing called the aperture. It's like the little circle that mm-hmm. the light comes in and it can be bigger or smaller and that changes certain things. And there's the, the length of the lens and that changes certain things. And you can't, like there's no length of the lens on your, your, on your phone. phone. It's just this tiny you know? thing. Yeah. And that, that means that there are limitations to the depth of field that you can mess with. And what is I depth think the of new, field? The new iPhones, like, they imitate it, right? So they what's, have the, what's depth of field for people that don't know what that so term So the means? depth of field is um, how, how a, like, thick of a slice of what you're shooting is in focus. Okay. So As um, in, like, distance the, the from way the camera. Yeah. The way it's used a lot um, is to make the blurry background that you'll yeah. see. Like, if you see um, a photo of a person and their face is in focus, but the background is like tastefully blurred and stuff. Mm-hmm. Unless that's done using the thing that imitates it on the new iPhone. The it portrait is, mode, yeah. which barely which, works. Which it's just trying to imitate it, but yeah. it's not doing the real thing and it can't do the real it's thing. It's basically doing a Photoshop filter. It's yeah. Like, it's like yeah. intelligently cutting it's out basically doing and that. blurring the rest. But there's like, yeah, basically you, when you have a shallow depth of field, it means less of it's in focus. So that person's face is in focus, but the stuff behind or in front of them isn't in focus. It's a small little slice of like the 3D world in front of you. Yeah. And, and if anybody you wanna... listening to this right now can can get a picture of this. Just like look at your hand and you will notice that everything else oh, is yeah, this, blurry in the background. This effect works with our eyes. And then if you yeah. take your hand further away from your face, um, the background will get less blurry. Yeah, and there's there's all sorts of physics involved, like with with um, if your if the aperture is uh, bigger, if it's wider then, open, uh, yeah, if it's wider open, then more light comes in, and then stuff happens. Well, yeah. actually, it might be less light in that situation. I get them confused because my hands do all the work. Wouldn't and it I be muscle, if the I've aperture is wider open, them. more light is coming in? Because that's a bigger hole, so more light, right? Let's see. There's a there's a website where you can like get the actual physics of it because now that I'm so used to it, I don't think about it. I changed the settings, but one of them is like the, the little F stop number gets bigger as something gets, there's an inverse relationship in one of them that always confuses me. I could be wrong, but the bigger your F stop number is, the smaller the aperture hole is and the less light comes in, but also the depth of field, the depth of field is really wide. Yeah. So if, so the less light the camera has, the more or the less blurry background you're going to get, the more that depth of field is going to widen out. Yeah. And then the, the, which is why it's really difficult to get a really blurry background when you're outside in the sunlight, unless you have a filter in front of your lens that cuts. Yeah. Down because light. you, you get so much light in when yeah. you're trying to do the shallow depth of field, it's too much light. And then, and I don't understand you the physics of why it. that depth of field changes with the amount of light. you're. I don't in, remember. I knew at one point, but like, um, I'll mention something at the end. I have a list of resources, but there's there's like this triangle of um, oh, they shutter the triangle. shutter speed, aperture, and then ISO, ISO yeah. that that affect how much light you're you're getting or not. But basically, there are a lot of artistic things like the blurry background, or what if you wanted it to include the stuff behind them? Also, it's like a landscape. You want to get the mountains. Mm-hmm. You need you can't do that the same way. Yeah, with a phone. You can't get past your minimum focal distance. So I wanted to take a photo of the little ladybug that was eating whatever it was eating. And I couldn't. There was yeah. there was nothing you can do about it. You cannot get closer than that and have an in-focus photo. Yep. So and eventually... A, you can actually simulate that too. Just like hold your finger very close in front of your eye and try to yeah. focus on it. Eventually yeah. you and can't. And there's, like, there's a point at which you can do... No Photoshop's going to fix it. Mm-hmm. Nothing's going to fix it. I guess you could take a photo from back and zoom in, but you're gonna you're ruining the quality and it, you're yeah. going to run out of pixels at some point. So that was actually my biggest reason for wanting to so change you things. wanted to get closer to Macro has been, been my biggest interest. And um, I, I didn't even get the, the lens first to do that. I got extension tubes that let you try out Macro. Mm-hmm with limitations that are annoying. And then I loved it when I got my new lens, Yeah, but they were $18. Instead of 1100 Instead of 1100 <laughs> So it was very worth working within the limitations first. Mm-hmm. But like basically it's the kind of uh, the physics of the kinds of things you want to take photos of okay. and how that's going to change things for you. So macro had different limitations for me. So whatever you're interested in, you are going to come to a point potentially where you're like, I really want the photo to do this 
Yeah. And I've seen other people do this, but I can't. And it's it'll depend on whether you prefer landscape or macro or portraits or underwater stuff. You can get special gear for that that I kind of want to get. But yeah, I should learn to swim before I try killing myself underwater taking photos. I just want to get a GoPro with an underwater housing. It would it would be so cool. Yeah. I've seen I've seen like macro photos really up close of like fish, mm-hmm. and they just it's incredible. But until you have something you really want that you can't do, like I guess I can't predict very well what limitations yeah. you are going to run into any any given person that's trying this. And that's important because you may want to do a different type of photography. Like if you want to do, um, you know, if you want to take photos of birds, you need a long telephoto yeah, I, lens. I need, I need a better, I've never gotten a good photo of have. a bird because I, don't, I have. don't have something to get close enough. And there's yeah. this thing about birds where they go away if you try to get really <laughs> close to them. They yeah. don't, unless it's like a pigeon, they don't want to be around you. So if mm-hmm. I wanted to do more of that, I'd have to get, I can get a better zoom lens. I have a basic one and I can get a better one, but it's more expensive than the lens that I have right now. So once again, yeah. I need to prove I'm interested. And I think most people know this, but some people might say like, oh, I can just pinch and zoom my phone to zoom in. You're not actually zooming in. You're just, you're just like cropping. cropping. So you end up with a photo that's a uh, lower resolution, essentially. Yeah, and if you wanted to the, print the lens them, can't actually change its optics to zoom in physically. So again, if you want to take photos of subjects that are far away, you need a lens that can zoom in physically a lot. So you need like a telephoto lens. Yeah, and, and you're, you're just going to be so clear compared to like even just cropping in a good photo. Yeah. Because because it's it's taking a full resolution photo using the entire sensor at that local yeah, distance. Yeah, it looks so cool. And that's why a lot of my photos, um, when they're of insects or other arthropod type things, you know, arachnids and whatnot, I will have another photo that you can swipe to the, oh, yeah. to the left. You're, you're swiping your thumb to the left, but maybe people call that swiping to the right because you're going to the right. I, do, I digress. I don't know. Yeah, I don't you know. swipe and then there's like, I've cropped in so you could see the actual resolution of what I'm looking at on my mm-hmm. computer to see how sharp the spider is or how because Instagram has the limitations. Yeah, and you I, can't zoom in with Instagram. Yeah, which and you can only post a like- great portfolio. You can only post like 1080 wide or something. Yeah. So it's like, it limits it, but you can get so sharp when you get the right kind of lens for the distance you're trying to work with. Mm-hmm. And you get so much detail where it's like, I've never even seen that part of a fly's mouth before. Yeah. And yet there it is. So um, just off the top of my head to think of some other areas of photography that you may want to upgrade gear for, a big one's gonna be low light performance. Most phones have terrible low light performance. Um, and for you know an amazing example, the Sony A7S III, and now that it's out, it, its ISO can go the up to Sony like 200,000. are absurd. You can take a photo with a Sony A7S II or III in like almost near darkness that will look like it was dusk. Like it, it goes so far past what your eyes are able to do. It's insane. Yeah, and the, your phone just can't ridiculous. do that. So, and one thing I do want to mention, there are apps that can make your phone a better camera. Um, and I, I want to tell true. people the That's true, you were messing around the with app. the one. Because when we were in Moab, I was messing around with an app that was like a pro photography app uh, let me see and if you, I can You can find control it. some of the things. So like yeah. you can you can use this to try manual stuff. So it, it's called ProCam. I think I paid maybe ten or fifteen dollars for it. Obviously, it doesn't change the hardware of your phone's camera. But most phones normal camera app will not let you uh, basically do manual control very much. So like the iPhone will let you do it lets you change exposure, but with this you can actually change like the shutter speed. You can actually change the ISO. You can actually change, like you can do um, light trail mode where it will actually do like a four, eight, or 30 second exposure. So I took my phone camera to Moab because we were out there and we were looking at stars and I didn't bring my normal camera and I was gonna try to get like star trail photos. But due to the phone's hardware limitations, even with a 30 second exposure, it just couldn't get anything. Yeah. Because it doesn't have that sensitivity to low light. So you need a better camera with a better sensor that can also do that long exposure time. So there's like low light, there's dynamic range, um, there's simple shutter speed. If you wanna do like sports photography. Oh yeah, you, you need got, yeah, all the dudes on can, the side of a football game got those giant like lenses exactly. with, the, with the super fast shutter speeds. Cause if you think about it, 
uh, the way a camera takes a photo is it opens the aperture for a certain amount of time to let light in. So the longer that thing is open, more light gets in, you get a brighter photo. And then the bigger the aperture is, the bigger that hole is, the more light you get. Well, if you want to capture like sports footage or not footage, but sports photos, then it has to be open for just a fraction of a second, like one two hundredth of a second probably. And that's not a whole lot of light. Yeah, you don't want to. So you need very good. It'll be low too blurry otherwise, unless you're trying to do an artistic blur that in, it implies motion. But see, yeah. once again, now you're getting intentional, so that's okay. Exactly, you yeah. can do that. But but there, are, yeah, there are many different th- reasons why you may want to upgrade from a uh, a phone camera. And I think the biggest one for most people is they want to get that blurry background, which is why yeah, I, I think I that that's put uh, the portrait mode in there. Probably Everyone the wants... most obvious thing because it, it mm-hmm. it's an easy way to make things. You focus on the one thing. It's clear what your subject of the photo is. Yeah. So if people are curious about how you do this, and I know I was, when I started as a YouTuber, I was like, that's what I want. I want the blurry background. Uh, a few, the factors that are going to influence it are the aperture of the lens. So the lower the f-stop number, yeah. the, um, the more blurry background you're going to get. The focal length of the lens, I believe the, the higher it is, the more blurry background you're going to get. So if you took like a 135 millimeter lens and like you took a picture of somebody and you had them like stand at a uh, at a distance that made it like made them fill the frame as much as you took with like a 35 mil, you will get more blurred background with the longer lens, I think. And then the closer the subject is to the lens will give you more of a blurry background and the further the background is away from the lens will give you more of a blurry background. So if you want like the blurry as possible, get a low f-stop number get your subject really close to the lens and then have a background that goes way off in the distance. And this is why it's tough to get a good blurry background if you're like a YouTuber in a bedroom because your background's not very far from the lens. Yeah. To get it in my videos, I have a quite expensive Sigma lens that goes down to F1.8. It is almost against the wall and then I stand pretty darn close to it. So we have like this entire table's length between me and the wall, which gives me a little bit of blur. Yeah, and it can be just that that makes the difference between it like looking like just a video you took at home or like a professional level. It mm-hmm. looks more professional when you have things like that going on. Yeah. So given all that, what would you recommend for people who want to move from their phone to like their first camera? Like, do you have any recommendations? I love my camera. I think that the A6000 mirrorless is an excellent camera. It's got really good night sensor, not as good as the full frame Sony ones, but But it goes up to like 6,400 or some 64, maybe 64,000. Obviously those are different numbers, but I think that's double. It doesn't, it doesn't go as high as the upgraded Sony's, but it goes like way higher than most other cameras will. And probably higher than you would need. Probably higher than I would ever use. Um, but it's it's there if I need it for something weird. You know, I see like a, like a Sasquatch in the middle of the night. I'm going to turn that up. I'm going to get the picture. Someone's going to finally get a photo and of Sasquatch, then, uh, all these good low light cameras. It's a light. It's light. And so it's easy to carry for a long period of time. It's the mirrorless thing. The one I have. So the A6000 has got this electronic viewfinder in it. And I think this is a difference between like your DSLRs and mine is that the electronic viewfinder that I look through previews what the shutter speed will do yeah what the aperture changes will do so i'm like i'm in shooting a manual messing with the dials and watching as my screen that i'm looking at darkens or brightens or gets blurrier or or gets more in focus Mm -hmm. so i can really preview all this and it's allowed learning how to shoot manually to become very intuitive i'm watching it happen whereas like as far as i could tell unless you're staring at the back screen you don't get that on your camera? In my camera, if I look through the viewfinder, I'm actually it's looking just at like a, it's, it's like just you're looking mirror. through like an old. Yep. And so if we, I can't see what my settings are going to do. Like so you just we have to, to take gardens, like 30 photos to figure out what shutter speed you want to do. You yep. just have to keep doing it over and over and that's And I'm sure there's a harsh some way to old learn. school tough cookies out there who'd be like, "Yeah, well that, you know, teaches you how to set your camera, like it teaches you how to like gauge the environment and what to set your camera at." 
Maybe. Yeah, but I'm learning but... the same thing without that obnoxious. <laughs> like, it's a really terrible barrier of entry for anybody who's going to be discouraged failing this yeah. one single photo 30 times in a row because they didn't guess the right settings. I think the most frustrating thing for me was buying new lenses and finding out that they weren't calibrated perfectly. So oh, I would yeah. look and through I, my I viewfinder. I also don't think that's an issue for my lenses either because it's mirrorless. Exactly. I would see something in focus on my viewfinder. I would take a picture of it and then it wouldn't be in focus because the lenses weren't calibrated. So then I'd have to go into the camera software and like trial and error move things just like one tick, two ticks, and hopefully get it. No, see, I, I think that I love the fact that when I look through my viewfinder, I'm getting a much better prediction of what the photo looks like afterward. It yeah. allows me to figure out what I want it to look like and to intuitively, now I've just automatically adjust the shutter speed or mm -hmm. the aperture the way I want. I yeah. always shoot on manual because since I can look through like that, it's really easy for me to, I have a feel for it now. I don't mm -hmm. need to just guess. I'm like, oh, I probably need to set it to this. Yeah, Bam, I would that's say correct. if it's your a budget, lot easier to get into it. I would say if your budget's like less than $1,500 and you don't want to do video, like mirrorless all the way. Yeah, and like I've, I've never tried to shoot video, so. The, and no, the, your camera will do good video because I started out I my no YouTube idea. career on a camera that was the precursor to yours. I had the oh, NEX yeah. 5N, which the A series replaced. Uh, the reason I say video is if you are on a lower budget, um, the lowest budget camera that I know of that has a jack for plugging an external microphone is a Canon camera that I can't remember the name of right now, but I'll have it in the show notes. Um, but it has like, I think it has the same sensor as my ADD, not as many focus points, but it does have that external mic jack. And if you wanna make videos, you need good audio. So if you are yeah. shooting on a camera like yours that doesn't have the mic jack, you have to find a way to externally record your audio, which isn't a huge deal. You can get like lav mics for your phone, but if you want to do like the whole YouTube vlogger thing and have like the microphone on top of your camera, then you would want a mic jack. Yeah. But otherwise like, yeah, the fact that you can look through your viewfinder and see a screen instead of like me having to look at that screen in the back in the bright sunlight, that's awesome. Yeah, it, take, it takes a lot of the guesswork out and it's mm -hmm. it would be hard to learn that way because then you're intentionally sitting here taking a whole bunch of photos at every shutter speed and saying, oh, wait, 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 which one gets brighter? Yeah. One of them gets brighter. Let me see again. It's not, you're not gonna like feel it the same way. You know, like how you ride a bike long enough, mm -hmm. you become sort of one with the bike and you no longer think at all. Yeah, that's how I can be with the camera now. And it was a lot easier to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I would say is as, as long as you're not like the kind of person that hates the idea of this, try to buy used because in photography, people generally take care of their gear and they sell it because they want to upgrade. Yeah, or so, switch brands, and then you got to buy brands. brand new lenses and everything. So exactly, like there's definitely a part of me that thing. wants to become a Sony guy because of how good your camera is. But like so I have, have to swap out like thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars stuff. of Canon lenses. Ooh, cameras are an expensive hobby. This is why you start cheap first. It, that's another thing. You might, yeah, you it might like gets real do research. Deep. You don't. And you might, you might get one camera with a kit lens, and then realize oh, I really want to be a Panasonic guy. You know, there's there's definitely compelling reasons to be a Panasonic guy, but that's a totally different lens mount. There's all these things. So if you go out and buy a ton of gear and lock yourself into one company's ecosystem, you could regret it. Yeah. You know, and I don't regret it too much. Like I, I love Canon's color science. I think they do the best skin tones. Um, and that's what the majority of my work is. It's my face on camera. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not too regretful of going with Canon, but there are definitely things I'm jealous of uh, with you having a Sony camera. Uh, so yeah, try buying used cause you can often get like the same gear that will perform just as well for like half price. People are often trying to unload their stuff. Um, and I would say like the one thing is just, you know, test it out and then have a quick look at the lens. Just make sure there's not any scratches on it and stuff like that. Yeah. That's a good way to get into it, get good gear for cheaper. And, oh, one question I was going to ask before we move on to non-camera gear would be how do people decide what lens to get first? Should they just go with a kit that's like a zoom? Should they go with a, a prime, which is just a fixed focal length? Like, what do, you, what do you recommend? I started out with the kit, but I didn't know about, about prime lenses yet. Okay. But I still 
might start out with the kit lens simply because it's got that little bit of zooming mm -hmm. that you can do. So it's a little, a little more flexible. A prime is going to be able to get a little sharper and it's going to have a lower f-stop capability. So more blurry backgrounds. It's great, yeah. but you can't zoom in or out. So like if I want to make this leaf that I'm taking a photo of on my prime lens bigger, I simply need to walk closer. And if I can't walk closer, there's nothing I can do about it. Mm. So like, I guess the kit lenses are usually pretty cheap. So I would probably start out with something like that if you don't quite know what you want to do yet. Okay. Because it's flexible. It will yeah. it will allow you to try out a few things. Mm -hmm. um, I also started out with a basic zoom lens, not 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 the most expensive one. It was the cheapest one uh, to see if I wanted to take photos of uh, things a little farther back. But I would start with the stuff that's cheaper and more flexible before then, you moved on. So I have a prime lens now. Okay. But that's because eventually I I knew that I wanted the lower f-stop more. Yeah. And you, so you wanted to do macro. Did you get the extension tubes for your fixed prime lens or did you get it for your kit lens? I actually, I think they work best on my kit lens. Oh, wow. Okay. So literally like you just had your basic setup with the kit and the body and then you bought and then like $18, $18 extension tubes. That's and then, awesome. Um, so a couple of the... My earliest photos on Instagram too. There's like a little bug that's out on a leaf, a little yellow beetle thing. And then there's a little leaf looking bug. And then a leaf that's like got a bunch of the, only the veins are there. Like it's suffering from some illness or was eaten oh, or something. Oh, i that, yeah. And those were, those were taken with the extension tubes. Oh, cool. So they're not quite as sharp as what I can take now. They're not quite, not quite as good, but I still like them. And they, yeah. they felt, I was so excited to take those photos. That $18 thing, absolutely helped me figure out that I like macro because mm -hmm. I still would not have felt comfortable dropping 1100. So yeah. first I get the camera and I take photos and then I get the extension tubes. Then I try out macro for a while. Then eventually like two years later, after taking tons of photos, I rent the lens I have now for two weeks. I rent it for the first week and I was like, I didn't have enough photo shoots this week. I'm going to extend it by a week. I need to try it more. Uh -huh. And then I bought the lens. So this stuff's so expensive and you get so locked in that I yeah. don't see a reason not to be cautious and start with the most flexible, easy stuff there is because I don't know, it's pretty easy to jump between hobbies and in order to find your real, like, not like your one true passion, but in order to find stuff you're passionate about, you need to try lots of things and yeah. probably reject several of them. And you can't do that if every single one you try costs you two or $3,000. Yeah, you you can't true. try out very many, so you better hope it's the right one. Well, you also brought up a good point about uh, renting your lenses. And you can, oh, you can rent the camera too if you oh, nice. if you really wanted. So if I wanted to upgrade my camera, I would probably rent one first to make sure that it wasn't going to annoy me going from my current version to like a full frame Sony. Did you did you have to rent through a local shop or is there a website you can do it through? I actually think you can borrow it through borrowlenses.com. Oh, borrow lenses. Also, okay. I think you can also borrow cameras. It's not the only one to do it. It just I just kind of went with the first one that had what I wanted. I didn't okay. I didn't care that much about um, comparing them, but. I, I wonder think you if can rent there's, cameras too. I wonder if there's also like local photographers groups. That would that, would that wouldn't gear, surprise me. Like just can I borrow a lens, you know, like through And Facebook. sometimes you can go to um they'll have like a little trade show and they'll have like Sony representatives and they'll be they'll have a bunch of lenses there and they'll be like, "Hey, put them on your camera. Go walk around, mess around with them." Oh, that's awesome. Uh there was some something I went to back in Iowa where they did that. Ooh, I just remembered something. Uh when we were in college, the communications department would actually rent out video making that, gear, that is pro true. level cameras. You could get them for free. Yeah. As a student. So, I mean, if people are in college, like you could look and see if that's also an option. Yeah. Like, we and use I, that to make some cool stuff you before can, I own anything. You can do so much of this stuff without having to drop a lot. It's just yeah. once you get into it, you need to know that this is an expensive hobby to continue pushing yourself in. Yeah. Uh, you know, As because so many are because I'm kind of like, oh, but I do want to get animals that are farther back. I need a better zoom. Yeah, but I kind of <laughs> want to get like space photos. How can I hook this up to a telescope and start doing some really crazy stuff? All this stuff is going to cost an underwater stuff. And now I'm going to have to get like what scuba gear and a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> it's a very expensive hobby. So um, trying out the cheap stuff is a very good investment. Yeah. I was trying to think the other day, like what, which of my hobbies aren't expensive? Because... Climbing is expensive, 
Uh, figure skating is expensive. Well, you Mountain could, biking you is. Could, you could skateboard for... But I realize, yeah, skateboarding is cheap as long as you don't hurt yourself. And slacklining is even Even getting a good skateboard, it's not going to cost you the same as getting deep into photography real fast. A good skateboard is $100. Yeah. And as long as you aren't doing, like, all these downstairs, you probably aren't going to break it very quickly. Yeah. So skateboarding is actually a decently cheap hobby. Basketball is probably, like, the cheapest... Never mind. Outdoor calisthenics and, and oh, like... Okay handstands that's probably the cheapest hobby you need a piece of ground <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah it can definitely get expensive uh i wanted to ask you because i know there are many answers to this question what are some things people can get in terms of gear or start doing to take better photos without upgrading the camera because I feel like... Wait, so what was, what was the gear part in the beginning? So, like, yeah. Are, are there any other pieces of gear that people can get to take better photos? And also, like, what are some just quick tips or techniques people can use to get better quality photos? Okay. So, so I guess it's two questions. Let's um, start with the gear. Well, with the gear, I guess... You, d- you don't want to upgrade too much, right? We're not, we're not going to get brand new lenses and whatever. I'm talking about, like, getting a tripod. Okay, for, that kind know, of stuff. Okay, I just need to know what level exposure. because, like... Anything like that. Yeah. So one of the things that you can do is, uh, so tripods are really useful. And one of the things I have with my tripod, I would never use my tripod without it, is a little cable with a remote shutter that will that oh. will click the camera. So the reason you're going to want to do this, if I'm taking, I did this just, just yesterday, actually. There was harsh sunlight coming in on the thing I wanted to take a photo of. And I need, I wanted the, the depth of field the way I wanted it. But... There's a point at which, um, so I had a a larger depth of field. I wasn't getting as much light in, but I wanted the light from the sun, but I didn't want to shake. So if I lower the shutter speed so that it's slow, it pulls in all the light I want, now it's bright enough. The problem is I can only shoot a handheld photo at like an 80th or a 60th of a second before I shake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it's blurry. Yeah, there's there's like a limit to what you can do as a human. Yeah. So now I put it on the tripod. Now I can take the still photo. I've lined uh-huh. it up. But even then, depending on the type of photo you're taking and how long your shutter speed is, hitting the button is going to bump what you've prepared a little bit. Yeah. So I've got the wired shutter down here. So I've got it all set up, and I can hit this button as much as I want, and it will be exactly the same photo every time. Oh, nice. Because I'm not bumping the camera on accident. I'm not That's bumping true. the tripod. I'm doing nothing. So that little shutter was 15 to $20, a, a tripod... Well, that that varies a lot depending on what you want, but like it's not cheapest one I own is third no twenty bucks. Yeah, Amazon, like you can, you can definitely get a cheap tripod and the um, camera filming you is on right now. Yeah, and, and I like it has uh, it has it doesn't have like a ball head, but it has like it has pan and tilt. The only thing that's oh, yeah. bad about this tripod is it's really flimsy. So if you had like a really heavy expensive setup, you might not want to have. Oh, if you have an expensive, you it. don't want a tripod that doesn't like cost enough to just it's protecting something much more expensive yeah so, so like we have a 20 dollar tripod right there and then over this there is okay because we're not taking photos like on the side of a mountain or something exactly that would be really dumb that one's 20 bucks that one is 350 like that's the one i'm bringing when i have my yeah. my slider and like my very expensive lenses and stuff but the, again like we do pro level work on that yeah for a business Oh, and so um, also Gorilla Pods, I really like. Yeah, those are nice. One thing I wanted to mention before we move on from the shutter thing, some cameras, I know mine can, have Wi-Fi connection where you can control it from your phone. So oh, like yeah. with mine, yeah. I can do a Wi-Fi setup and then I can use my phone as the shutter. That would thing. that would also work. Yeah, anything where like the tripod to hold it still and then being able to, to click it without shaking the camera. Because mm-hmm. if you're trying to do something in in low light or whether you're trying to have a larger depth of field so the light's naturally lower you you simply can't hold the the camera still for like two seconds straight it's not going to happen i know one thing some photographers recommend is also a monopod specifically because there are times when you just there's not room to put a tripod but having a single leg on the ground will just reduce that shake and then you can hold it uh also i know there are locations out there that if you bring in a tripod they classify that as pro photography work and you need a license, yeah. but a monopod isn't. Oh, which well, is that's it's so stupid, but yeah, you're I've, still putting something on the ground. But like a monopod the fact could work too. I've that never will eliminate used one. any up and down shake at least. Yeah. So it can eliminate a lot of. Honestly, know. I don't bring my tripod almost anywhere just because really? 
I do almost exclusively handheld because now I'm messing with the shutter speed and everything enough that mm-hmm. I can make sure. I know what numbers I can't go past to hold it still. Gotcha. So it's it's difficult. But I just – because it's a meditative, walking around, exploratory thing for me, carrying a bunch of gear is obnoxious. Mm-hmm. So I like handheld more. If I'm trying to take something real serious, I'll bring my tripod. But most of the time, I'm just trying to have fun. Gotcha. And I don't want to take it too seriously. But definitely, if – if you want to have flexibility for different lighting situations, mm-hmm. at least just a little little tiny gorilla pod would work. And then the remote thing on your phone or or the wired or you can get a wireless one, little remote. Because otherwise if you keep you keep tapping it, you're gonna misalign the photo you're trying to take over and yeah. over. Uh one thing that I would mention is light itself. So oh, yeah. This isn't really a piece of gear, but the time of day that you shoot photos, if you're doing anything where it's outside or where there's outside light coming in can matter a lot. So the, uh, in photography, they often talk about like the golden hour, yeah. which is I think like sunrise or sunset where the sun is just like almost at the horizon. So it's creating this very warm dynamic light coming yeah. from the, and the side. shadows. The shadows are real long too. Yeah. So if you take like, the reason I didn't like my um, Arches pictures very much is because it's so harsh, so like midday, mm-hmm. there are no shadows, so there's no depth. But if you see a photo with mountains and there's like shadows going everywhere, the shadows create a lot of depth. They make yeah. the photo seem more 3D mm-hmm. and you you can't get that at midday. It yeah. simply won't work. Uh, and then if you take photos inside, using your own lighting can really help things. So, I mean, I come at this from a video guy's perspective, but we've got lights all over this room that you know make us look a lot better overhead light looks terrible yeah it does because it it casts shadows horribly it's often not nearly bright enough so when people watch me on youtube i have a giant softbox light it's like i don't know a foot from my face and then there's also all the lights in the background that kind of separate me from the background and you can build lights for cheap like you can go to lowe's or home depot and i've built Lights, just buying those little shop lights, little LED light bulbs, and then covering them with wax paper that you would cook with. Yeah. Just to diffuse it. Because that's another thing. Diffusion is is very important. Um, I know for portraits, you often don't want to shine your light directly on the person. It's better to point a bright light at like a white bed sheet. You like, you like bounce it off of them Mm -hmm. or something like that. And you can do that with your little flash that comes off the top too. If you like hold it up so that it's pointing up, it'll bounce off the ceiling. Yeah. Sometimes that'll work. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so usually light being directly thrown at your subject will make it look very harsh and bad. Whereas, and it's sometimes you want that. Like if you're doing like a harsh, like noir shot or something. But usually you want to diffuse it or bounce it off of something. Uh, which is why we have soft boxes and wax paper on like every light in this room. Yeah, and you can get different additions. You can get like uh, this little, you can get a ring of lights that goes around your lens for macro stuff oh, to yeah. light up the stuff. You can get a thing that goes in the, like the hot shoe mount, mm-hmm. is that what it's called? I don't have anything that uses that because I mostly don't alter my lighting. Yeah. It, I almost entirely do stuff with uh, outside lighting. But you you definitely want to be able to manipulate that if you're interested in something that's uh, inside. I actually kind of want to take black light photos at some point. That would be because cool. Because I think that would be a really interesting like way to explore what like nature and stuff looks like. What's this flower look like under a black light? This yeah. is really cool for me to see. But... One little upgrade I've done for my phone, uh, I have this little photo case from, uh, I think it's a a company called Moment, and it just has this little um, cutout where the camera is, and it's like a mount for lenses they make. And then I have this wide angle lens. So it just mounts on there and allows me to take wide angle photos or videos with my iPhone. So anytime people see me doing like athletic stuff, in my Instagram pictures, I usually am using that wide angle lens so I don't have to put the camera ridiculously far away. Yeah, and that's a pretty cool way to upgrade uh, your phone camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and it's How much relatively cheap. I think the lens was like 100 bucks and then the okay. case was 30. So if you don't wanna buy a camera but you wanna get wide angle, that's way cheaper than even like a GoPro. Yeah, but you'd still wanna test this stuff out to even realize, wait, I need a wider angle. Yes. You, do, you don't wanna just invest in, there yeah. are so many different things you could do I bought that because I wanted to be able to take like, like selfies you have videos a specific and I was purpose. like, oh, there's not enough of me in the video. Yeah. Or especially if I want to hold my phone in front of me and do a, like a selfie video, I can't see what, the screen and I don't want to use the front facing camera because it's lower quality. And a lot of times I would be cutting half my face off just because you can't see where your hand is pointing. So I got the wide angle lens 
just to eliminate the guesswork. With the wide angle lens, if I hold it out in front of me, I'm going to be in the frame, almost guaranteed. Yeah. You know, I don't know the exact position, but it's close enough. Uh, so what about some techniques? Like how can people elevate their photography game regardless so, uh, of the gear? A have? really, really basic one is like the rules of the rule of thirds, where um, if you picture like a, a grid going through your um, your photo, there are like three slices this way. Mm -hmm. The two slices, the two lines are an interesting place for things to be, especially mm -hmm. if they intersect with like the, the lines that would slice it in thirds the other direction. So okay. there are like these four corners in the middle that are a really decent basic place to put stuff if you don't really have a vision for it. So like instead of putting somebody right in the middle of a photo, yeah, you, you kind of offset you usually, them a bit. Yeah, you'd want to offset them. Sometimes you do want a centered photo, okay. but as a very basic, like easy thing to do most of the time, stuff looks good in the thirds, unless you have an artistic reason to not want that. Like if you're taking a square photo, mm -hmm. which like you probably want them in the middle if it's a square photo. Yeah, I have noticed the that. the point is that it's just, you're doing something different with the perspective for a reason, I imagine. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but I break the rule of thirds a lot. I also follow it a lot. It's like, you don't have to do it. It's just a good starting place for stuff to look kind of cool. Yeah. Um, one thing, one of my favorite things actually, that the, so the classes I took, the my teacher had this technique for how to see more because all this other stuff, the technology, the techniques, that's all right. If you taught somebody that, but they didn't have any vision and they didn't know how to look for what they were looking for, it wouldn't matter. Mm. So his thing was we read in our native language left to right. So we're kind of used to scanning things left to right. So if I'm going to go outside and look for stuff, I'm looking for bugs somewhere, I should look from right to left because I will look more carefully. I'm not used to skimming really quickly in that direction. Oh. So obviously flip this if you speak a language that's written in the other direction. But like we just tend to naturally skim left to right mm -hmm. and not think that hard. So I might go right over an interesting insect or a shadow that looks cool. But if I'm looking right to left, I'm looking more intentionally. Yeah. Otherwise, you might rush yourself along this beautiful forest path and be like, there was nothing to take a photo of. And that's probably not true. Mm. Like, you're just not that's paying genius. attention. You're just rushing right through it. And that's my favorite thing, right? Because you don't, like the rule of thirds, I could have found that in an article right now. It's a pretty commonly known thing. But mm -hmm. looking in the opposite direction has helped me be more observant. And yeah. nothing is more important than that. Yeah. My ability to see things to bother taking a photo of is more important than any anything that I could buy or learn. Mm -hmm. I suppose one thing that I would suggest is vary up your perspective or the camera's perspective. Like most people take photos from standing height and oh, like yeah. hold the camera yeah. out at pretty much the same height always. So just to differentiate yourself and make your photos more interesting try lowering the camera and pointing up a little bit more or making the camera higher. Uh, and if you have a gorilla pod, you can often just like wrap the gorilla pod on a chain link fence or just on something weird where usually a camera wouldn't go. And then you can do really yeah. cool pictures. Like I did one of me on a slack line the other day and I put the camera so the lens was like directly where the slack line began. So you can kind of like see the line going to where I am yeah. a bit. Yeah, and it's a lot cooler because it's something you wouldn't normally see because yeah. we're not operating at that height. You'll notice a lot of my macro photos, almost exclusively, the insects or flowers are on my level. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm lower than them or I'm directly like, I've got some insect ones where I wanted to be on their level. So it was like, what if I was seeing them as another insect? This yeah. is my world that I'm looking at. Yeah. The, because if you just like shoot an ant from above, we see that all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not nearly as like compelling you know what details are there. Yeah, I guess like, yeah, an interesting photo takes you to a place where you usually don't see things. Yeah, and that's you why being observant is so important. What you, what you want to do is find a way that, we take all this stuff for granted. I love trees and flowers and insects and spiders. We take them for granted, especially if we don't like spiders, but <laughs> we take them for granted because we walk past them every day, but we're not looking from a new perspective. You know how um, even in school, if they'd ever switch up the, the seating arrangement mm -hmm. and I'm just like suddenly on the other side of the room I'd be like this room looks so different right yeah. now and it's just the dumbest thing because obviously it's the same room but mm -hmm. a perspective shift can change everything yeah and uh, another note before I forget it because you mentioned the slack line another cool thing is uh well one thing 
people tend to look at the like the brightest thing in a photo first. That just tends to be a place where the eyes go. Mm-hmm. So you may want to make sure that your focus, your subject gets to be that or that you have a reason for not having that. Okay. Another thing is that we like to follow lines. So that slack line gives us something to like, where we're like gonna oh, follow yeah. it down the photo and be like, oh, there's Tom on the slack line. Or if you got a photo of a forest trail and you have it to where you can like, where's that going? Mm-hmm. And, and we follow it and it creates like a story, a bit of depth to the to the photo. And, oh man, there was, a, there was another thing. I was about to say, I just lost it. <laughs> I don't know, I'll get it back. Probably. There's all sorts of tips. Probably. Yeah. Well, there is one more question from Andre here. Oh yeah. Uh, Legacy has two, but one is just like, you know, what are some links? Uh, the one before that is, what have you learned from observing professional photographers? Or is is there value in that? Do you do that? I don't really spend uh, almost any time looking at other people's photography. Okay. Almost none. Because I already had a kind of a taste for what I wanted to be taking photos of. I, mm. I already knew what I wanted because I just like the little things. I want to take macro photos of stuff. Yeah. But it can be useful. And uh, there are obviously the, you know, the obvious screws like Ansel Adams does really cool black and white landscape. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to look at. If you study how they did stuff and maybe figure out why they did stuff, it could help you improve. But uh, if I had to pick something that I've learned from other photographers online, it would be that uh, there are a lot of people who can sell their photos and are professionals and I don't particularly think they're taking good photos. <laughs> so the thing here is, if you want to be a photographer, do not expect to immediately be taken seriously because there's such a low barrier of entry. That last part of creation is just clicking a button. That's true. Yeah. But it's about the the thought that goes into it and the preparation beforehand that matters. But mm-hmm. because it's just clicking a button at the end, if you want to become a photographer – for anything, for weddings, senior photos, artistical print things like what I'm doing, you need to accept that you can't just go around saying, hey, I'm a photographer and have, people aren't going to care. There are plenty of photographers online that have like, just, it's just, it's not good because they assume when you have the, the equipment that it makes them professional photos. Right. So you need to be willing to work at this and like prove it to yourself that you're putting thought into the photos. The mm-hmm. equipment is not enough, and and there are going to be people succeeding that are taking photos you don't think are as good as yours. And that's simply going to be life, and you're going to have to deal yeah. with that. It's it's a, an art form or a business choice that a lot of people try to do stuff with. Mm-hmm. And when something is democratized like that, it's everybody has a camera phone now. Yep. It's easy to get a camera because they become cheaper and cheaper in time. When stuff becomes open to the public you get better stuff because more people see it, but you also see more worse stuff. So don't spend all your time looking at stuff that makes you mad and don't mm-hmm. don't like narcissistically call yourself a professional photographer the first day that you take a photo because you bought an expensive $10,000 camera yeah. and you thought you could just point it at your dog and now you're a millionaire. It's, it's like humility. I think it's going to be important to enter something that's so widely entered. And you got to realize, like, technical ability or proficiency is, is not the only reason why things become popular. Like, you see this in music, too. A lot of musicians will get really mad because a lot of popular songs are just, like, four-chord songs. It's like, that's the same four chords over and over again. Yeah, but it's catchy. Yeah. Or, like, we were in yeah. a restaurant, and for some reason, the fancy Italian restaurant we were at was playing, like, trap music. And there was just, like, this song, and, like, the dude was just like, I walk it like I talk it. I walk it like a target, and I'm like, "That's fair." The beat under this is literally the same four notes over and over again, and then like the simplest trap beat. I could build this in Fruity Loops or in Ableton in like five minutes, and then I could also just be really confident and slur my words in the microphone. But that doesn't mean like I don't know. Like maybe maybe I could do better than that, but it doesn't mean that that doesn't deserve to be popular because clearly people like it. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. they wouldn't. It's, pay it's not to always it. about the most technical thing in the yeah. world. So, don't don't be weird and mean to other photographers if you don't like their stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular. It's just that tons of people try to get into this, and it yeah. means that 
saying, oh, I'm a photographer in my spare time isn't going to necessarily mean a lot to a lot of people because yes. of that. But and, and because all the work in the beginning, if you look at my earlier photos, they're probably not as good as the ones I've been taking lately. Mm -hmm. And you need to be prepared to take tons of photos that aren't good yeah. before you even start to kind of like them before they become good in some sense. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's good to know that there are other sub skills in photography, depending on what you want to do. So the thing that comes to mind right now is if you want to be a portrait photographer, then it's not just your technical ability as a photographer that matters. It's your ability to get your subject comfortable yeah. and doing things that allow you to catch those candid moments that look better than just like telling them pose this way and smile or look demure or something like that. Yeah. Cause um, you have to interact with the real people. Mm -hmm. And that's the skill. Like a lot of people are not good at making somebody feel comfortable on the other side of a lens. Yeah. And I've had to develop the skill of not scaring off insects. Exactly. Like actually when I look at like those, I have to be uh, absurdly careful to get that. I've got like three inches from a dragonfly facing me. When I look at like national geographic photos, Often my mind is bogged. Like, how do these photographers get these people who, like, maybe some of them never even seen a camera before, to just like stand there for like this ridiculously artistic photo and like look so candid? Like, that is a skill. Because I I would be so scared to even approach somebody like, hey, can I take a, you know, this like picture of you? It's gonna take me like seven minutes to set up or something like that. And they're just like going about their business. Yeah, but that's so. that's what it is. It's all about. It's like the preparation and the thought that goes in before you even think about mm -hmm. hitting the the button to take the photo. Yeah. Before you even do that, there are so many things that you could learn. So uh, his last question here is, you know, what are some links to get in-depth information, uh, useful apps and a budget setting to start? I think we kind of covered the budget, like start with your phone. Yeah, I would, I would start with the upgrade. lowest budget that you can tolerate to yeah. get into it. Upgrade deliberately, meaningfully. And yeah, slowly. you should you should never upgrade thinking that it's just going to make you better. You should upgrade when you hit a limitation and you're like, I know I understand the limitation and it will be fixed by this. Mm -hmm. You you need to have a specific like reason. Also, if you feel like you've hit a wall, I would I would say challenge yourself to find a way, at least in one session, to break past the wall before you buy something else. Good example being. Uh, I really wanted to do a video where like I made my set look like Luz from uh, Unbox Therapy. And he's like at a table and he, you can see like the whole table and you can see him in the shot. So I was like using my normal lens and I was like, I can't do this, why can't I do it? I, like, if, I, if I zoom out enough to get the table and my head in the shot, then like the whole room's in the shot. And then I'm like, oh, I've got a wide angle lens. Maybe that's what he's doing. So I put the wide angle lens on there. My wide angle lens is really cheap so the footage I was initially getting looked really bad. And my first initial thought was, okay, I guess I gotta go buy out and buy, or go out and buy a very expensive wide angle lens. But by fiddling around with my color grading in post, I was able to get a result that I was actually pretty happy with. So I haven't yet gone out and bought a better, more expensive wide angle lens. I still have my same cheapo Canon one that was like 300 bucks, I think, which you can go way more expensive than that. Uh, and that does the trick. You know, or I could go build a set out in the living room where I have sunlight coming in and that would just give me more dynamic lighting and it wouldn't matter if I had a super sharp lens. Just yeah. like I'm improving my environment. So there's usually a way you can you can figure out how to get your result and then realize like, okay, I didn't actually need that expensive piece of gear. Because I think that if you always go out and buy the toy that solves a problem, then it's like like the holding the hammer and seeing everything as a nail, like if you if you just buy gear and you see everything as like just a purchase to be fixed. Yeah, money fixes all problems. Yeah, but but it but it doesn't. It's not going to. You know, I can go out and buy like a red camera, but I don't know how to use it. <laughs> and also, I don't want to. It's going to cost a bit. I want to buy a house, so I'm not going to yeah. buy a red camera because yeah. a red camera costs as much as a cheap house. That's <laughs> which is really weird so yeah, to that's, think about. That's completely absurd. My Andrew Febert, my I guess former podcast co-host, unless somebody matters, bought a house for uh, as much as a red camera can cost. He should trade he it in and get a camera. He doesn't live with it. He rents it out to people, but like I, it was a very cheap house, but still like he purchased a house for how much that camera yeah. costs. Uh, okay. So some links, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, I have a few. Okay. 
Um, these are all going to be YouTube channels for me. So I would start with Mango Street. Uh, it's this couple and they both are photographers and they have really good videos that just teach you cool techniques for upping your photo game. <laughs> Peter McKinnon is also really a great YouTube channel. Uh, his content is like a mixture of vlogs, but also in-depth tutorials. So those two guys are great. And then um, my friend Caleb Wojcik has a channel called DIY Video Guy. So his is more geared to video people, but he does have videos on like the aperture triangle or the exposure triangle. So I think even if you're just a photographer, there's a lot of skill transfer between those two mediums. Yeah. And lastly, uh, Fro Knows Photo, Jared Pollan. He has a lot of content, like a lot, a lot of content, but he's also a very good photographer. He's taken photos of like the Foo Fighters in concert, like been painted oh, nice. by them, stuff like that. So he knows his stuff. Uh, he's a little sillier than the other ones and sometimes it's hard for me to take him seriously, but he does know his stuff and his channel's a good resource. Okay. Uh, before I list things, I remembered that thing. And it was, uh, if you're taking a photo of something that looks like it might, like if I was taking a photo of a sailboat, it might be more compelling to have space in front of where it looks like it's going so that it looks like it's beginning its journey rather than oh. if it was at the end of the frame, it would look like it's ending. And yeah, that's most of the frame is behind the thing in action and it's not quite as compelling. So like if, if the sailboat's going... If it's to the left and outward, you'd want to put it on the right of the photo so you could like the so that it, so that I can kind of see where it's going, going to go. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That's a that's a good default. Once again, break it if you have any reasons to. Yeah, but it's kind of cool to see where it's going rather than oh, it's done. Yeah, we're done. Journey's over. It's more inspiring to look at where it's going. Yeah, that makes sense. So that that was the thing I forgot. Like I guess, and if you were taking like a, like the finish of a bike race, maybe you would do the opposite. Where yeah, you'd have maybe you know, you the do finish the opposite line so that you can emphasize the end. The end. Of the frame. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, things things I have listed. Um, so uh, I did have an article about the exposure triangle. I okay. guess if you're not cool with video, I didn't think about YouTubers because I don't really follow. You don't watch YouTube very or, much. Or I don't really follow anyone in any sense. Uh, <laughs> I am off the internet. I'm off the grid. I'm Ron Swanson. Um, so then there's this site uh, called photoephemeris.com. It's okay. really cool. It gives you like a giant map. It's like a, basically like a Google Maps thing, but overlaid with, I can drop a pinpoint anywhere I want, and then it will show me at different times of day that I also set in different seasons where is the sun what angle is the sun coming from what angle is the moon coming from so if i'm like this would look really cool if only the shadows were going that way i can drop that pinpoint and then figure out the shadows should hit that angle in like two weeks at around 5 p.m and then i can get my dream photo you can get real technical with sunrise and sunset times and shadow directions and Mm -hmm. the shadow lengths i believe it shows maybe i haven't been to it in a bit because with macro, it's not as relevant. But it's yeah. really cool for, like, landscape okay. and stuff. Um, it's probably got more photo uh, features I'm not even thinking of. Uh, then we've got borrowlenses.com, where I rented my macro lens. I'm sure there are others, but renting lenses and camera stuff is cool because it's expensive. Uh, I use Adobe Lightroom to process my photos. I don't do much with them, but it does... Um, At the very minimum, it will have a lens correction thing. So it'll be like, oh, you're using this Sony lens. We know that that means that we should do this to the... Like, there's a certain way to process them that makes them come out the way your camera would be doing it. Gotcha. To have... Otherwise, um, you might have some dark corners vignetting. Mm -hmm. You might have some weird stuff until it knows how to adjust correctly for your lens. Because otherwise, your camera body will do all that stuff by itself if you're just shooting in JPEG. Oh, I didn't even talk about that. Uh, People, they can, they can go down the rabbit hole and learn uh, about You don't that. need to shoot in RAW unless you're trying to do fancy stuff. I don't even I shoot do. in RAW. I shoot in RAW because I like fancy stuff, but you can start with JPEG and it'll be just fine. Yeah. Um, Affinity Photo is a one-time purchase thing that's mm-hmm. uh, similar. I like Lightroom more, but Lightroom is a subscription I have to pay for rather than yeah. a one-time program. And, and there's also, if you're on a Mac, Pixelmator, I think is even cheaper than Affinity Photo and still very good. That does sound familiar. I don't know if I've and used that. And then if you're on Windows, paint.net is free. You know, and it can do some stuff. Like if you just want to do exposure corrections and, and you want it like yeah. zero budget. Like it doesn't <laughs> have to get fancy. Um, 
So then uh, the, I can I can have a link to the extension tubes I bought. They work okay. with my camera. Otherwise, you're going to want to look them up for your own we camera. We can link to them just so people know what they're just looking so that's for. That's what the kind of thing is. Yeah. But then my final website here is lightpollutionmap.info. Okay. So if you want to take nighttime photos, it may annoy you to know that urban living and buildings basically ruin all of our vision of the stars if we're anywhere near a city. Yeah. If you go to this uh, lightpollutionmap.info, it will show you, again, sort of a Google or some sort of maps thing overlaid with where all the centers of light are coming from. So if I'm like, I want to take some star photos, I can look at where I am and look for the nearest spot where there's actual darkness. And that's going to be incredibly useful because you have to go quite a ways in some situations yeah. to get away from the immense city light. So with Denver, I've got to go a ways. And maybe I don't know what direction to go in to actually get to stars quickly. Mm -hmm. So this website would be a tremendous resource for anybody trying to take photos of stars and stuff. That's awesome. Or just to see stars for the first time, you know, because plenty is... of people probably have never seen what they look like without city stuff blocking it. That's an experience. It's like we like, they look sat really out cool. on those rocks in Moab for like three, four hours. Yeah, and I hadn't up. seen them like that since I like uh watched my grandparents farm a long time ago like yeah. maybe 10 years ago you know so you don't commonly see the night sky the way it really is mm -hmm. so even if you just wanted to use this to go check it out it's cool and i would recommend people do that that's an experience i have two more to recommend that you reminded me of um if you want to process photos on your phone i use an app called snapseed and i think Google either made it or bought it, but it, it just has a lot of really nice tools for quickly processing photos, making them look better. Almost every photo on my Instagram goes through Snapseed. I think that their editing tools are better than Instagram's native ones. So I use- Like the, filters and stuff? Um, so generally, I'll do like brightness, contrast, saturation, okay. sharpness. I didn't know to what degree uh, you It also has stuff. like a, a portrait finder so it'll find a face and then it will kind of like highlight that area of the photo just kind of like draw more attention to the face which is really good if i happen to catch a frame of video where my face was not well lit by the sun it can it can kind of compensate for your face being in shadow okay which is nice and then i believe this site is called mm calc and we'll have it in the show notes uh this i find useful because Typically, unless you are paying a lot for your camera, you're not getting what's called a full frame sensor. You're getting mm, yeah. a smaller chip, which means that if you buy a lens, and let's say that lens is a 35 millimeter lens, there's gonna be what's called a crop factor, which means that the light that the lens lets in, your sensor can't, can't like get the entire picture. It can only get a part of the picture that's in the middle because it's too small. Yeah. Which means that if you have a, like my Canon 70D and 80D have what are called an APS-C sensor, which is smaller than a full frame one. So if I put a 35 millimeter lens on my camera, I'm going to get a 52, I think, millimeter equivalent. So basically, if you like take, if like somebody brought their full frame camera over and took a picture of your room and you're like, I want that. So I'm gonna buy that exact same lens. But if you put it on a, a crop sensor camera, it's going to yeah, be, it won't be in, the same, yeah. You know, so if like you're a YouTuber in your bedroom trying to get your entire body on frame, you may need to get a wider lens. So MM Calc can show you. You can you can type in like this is the actual focal length of the lens, and here's my camera, and it'll give you the equivalent focal distance. Okay. And then you can be like, all right, does that actually work for my purposes? Um, and I know like some people in our standard Slack group found that useful when they were trying to do some on-camera stuff. So okay. I just figured I would mention it as well. Cool. And I think that'll that'll do it. Yeah, I guess if any of this stuff sounds really confusing and intimidating, you don't need to know any of it to get started. No, you like, don't. <laughs> you, you don't need to. Just I've been doing this pictures. since 2015 now. Yeah. And I took several classes and I learned a little bit at a time. And I mm -hmm. only recently with my new lens got good at shooting in full manual. So yeah. like it just... If, if you get intimidated, come back to this later when you understand more and maybe even more of the tips will mean something. Mm -hmm. But We just like to info dump. Yeah. Especially when it's a topic that both of us know a decent like, amount it, about. It's, it's useful stuff, but if it scares you, then it's not useful yet. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is one of those episodes that's going to have a lot of detail in the show notes. So you may want to check out our show notes, which you can find at cigpodcast.com slash 232 
or if you are watching this on YouTube or Facebook, there's going to be a link to those show notes in the description. So definitely check that out. Uh, beyond that, you can check out our favorite resources over at collegeinfogeek.com slash resources. There you're going to find our list of essential books for students, our uh, college packing guide, which lists basically everything you would need for a dorm or apartment, uh, or the cardboard box that you're living in, or the small hole in a tree on campus that you're living in. Because I do think Iowa State had a, a decent sized hole in a tree, and I often joked about living in that and not paying for the dorm. You know, So if you want to Someone should live in there. If you want to, like, decorate your tree hole to be a little more homey, then we got everything there. Yep. Uh, there's also a general resources page with apps and books and also a link to our merch page since I just realized I'm wearing our Never Stop Learning shirt. That is true. Which you can get. It's a good if shirt. you want to get that directly, you can go over to collegeinfogeek.com slash merch. I am working on getting a ladies' cut of that shirt and hopefully tank tops as well. Oh, cool because I want more tank tops for the gym and such. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to do that too. Beyond that, if you enjoy this podcast, a great way to support it is to make sure you are subscribed to it in Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. So you can get the new episodes every Monday when they come out. And if you are an Apple person, giving us a rating and review on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts is a great way to show us what we're doing right, what we can improve on. And also I believe those reviews do something to the Apple Podcast they, algorithm. They do something. I think they're good. Probably. So they probably are good. Uh, anyway, as always, thank you guys so much for watching slash listening, and we will see you in next week's episode. Stay cute.